All right, welcome to the Monday edition of On the Tape. I'm Dan Nathan, joined as always by Guy Christopher Adami and Liz Young. That would be EY from SoFi. She is the head strategist over there at Social Finance. Guy, what can you do all in one app? Get your money right. I mean, get your money right all in one application. They say app because it probably saves money on letters, but I get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Liz, w- w- you help us get our, our podcast right all, all in on Monday here. Yes, I mean, you do. I do my best. H- how you doing on this Monday morning? I'm doing lovely. I've, I've told you guys before, Mondays are my favorite day of the week. Okay. Stop Maybe it. Now, Fridays, see, you, but... you're making that up. I mean, no, I, I, I appreciate I like it. I like getting it going. I like, I like getting started. I don't like Thursdays because it's like you're almost there. Oh. It's been a long week. You're kind of tired, but you're not there yet. Wow. I like Mondays. Well, if you watch I, CNBC's Fast Money, you would know that Guy's favorite day of the week would be Wednesday because that would be hump day. Yeah. Is that why? I, I, I've never used that expression in my life. <laughs> By the way, there was a song. I think it was like the Boontown Rats or somebody. Tell, tell me why I don't like Mondays. Pretty shitty song, but you know I completely mm. digress. You do. Well, well, listen, we got a great show. We're gonna. It, there was a lot going on over the weekend. I don't know about you guys, but like, I was a bit captivated what was going on um, in Russia. And we're gonna hit some of the implications of that. We are not gonna offer our uh, two cents on, on the politics um, of of war. I think there's other podcasts that try to do that and sound um, really smart. But guy, you and I also. In our B block, we had a great conversation with Bastian Jean Mott. He's the managing director at Lynn's Capital. Yes, and he was in special situations at Goldman Sachs. Now, I'll tell you for the folks that are not um, aware, those special sitch guys at Goldman Sachs are sort of like the covert operatives of Wall Street. You know, they find things and they do things that nobody else knows about. But if they get caught doing them, it's like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. You know, they 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 basically say we have never heard of this person. But this guy could be on his squad in Mission Impossible. But he had a, he actually had a tremendous career. He uh, left there and went on to be an operator in Silicon Valley and sold that company to Verisign and then uh, joined Lynn's Capital and they invest their growth investors um, in emerging technologies. And we t- spend a lot of time actually talking about AI. So that was um, a great conversation. So stick uh, around for that. All right, let's get into it, people. On Monday, we kind of like to track some of our favorite fellow bears. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley would be one of them. Uh, David Rosenberg would also be another one of them. But Guy, well, let's start with this headline here because I love these sorts of headlines. This was um, from CNBC. Mm. Uh, this was talking about the bull market maybe just getting started here. And it was kind of highlighting some of the options activity, which would give some bulls, um, I guess, some confidence that uh, maybe some of the capital being committed to some of the favorite themes, at least in the options market with a VIX uh, you know, at 13 or so, um, remains bullish. I see those sorts of headlines as the other way. Talk to me a little bit when you wake up on a fine Monday morning. And there was a whole heck of a lot going on in macro world um, when you see a headline like that? Well, I, the first thing I say is, you know, they're obviously looking at something that I clearly am missing, number one. I mean, a bit of it's clickbaity, right? I mean, it makes people like us immediately try to read or attempt to read the article to find out what they're looking at. But what I've found to be interesting over the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> and maybe Elizabeth can speak about this, for the first time in a long time, on one side of the equation, people have never been more bearish. And on the other side, if you listen to um, like a Tom Lee I heard this morning on Squawk and Friends, and obviously Savita last week or on um, on Fast Money, she said it's the best environment in the last 10 years. So you have people as bullish as they've been in quite some time, flip side people as bearish. And quite frankly, I think both sides can make a pretty compelling argument. Now, I find myself obviously on the side of going lower for a myriad of different reasons that haven't manifested themselves. Price suggests the bulls are right, but you know, this battle line here at 4,400 is going to continue. I just, for the life of me, have a really difficult time embracing the bull side of the equation. Well, I think there's there's two different things going on. You can always have sentiment lean a certain direction, but then is positioning actually backing that up? I think that there's been a lot of commentary recently where people have flipped from bearish to more bullish, and there's this sort of FOMO, oh my gosh, what if it is the new bull and I'm missing it and I'm not there for it? But are they actually rotating their money into it in some of those higher beta places? I'm skeptical that they are because we had seen for a year straight outflows from equity markets. So I don't know that that's entirely stopped yet. And and the idea of people putting their money where their mouth is, 
The other thing, when you see headlines like this, I mean, it's a, a bit of a head scratcher on the timing, right? Because if you are somebody who's bullish, the argument has been that the low was last October, and that's when the new bull market began. And we've already seen six months of this year of pretty optimistic returns, particularly in a narrow part of the market. And then you see a headline like this six to seven months into it. It's almost as if these headlines are an indication that the bull market is overextended. And suddenly, suddenly everybody wants to talk about it. Uh, and, you know, we've obviously seen some softness in the last week or so, which could just be a little give back of getting too far too fast. But it also could be actually the beginning of a broader correction. So again, you know, we're right in that time of monetary policy legs start to rear their ugly head. You've got yield curve inversions that usually start to rear their ugly head. And we'll see what happens for the rest of summer. But I think we're in a precarious moment. And Guy, to your point, one of the most difficult markets to be an investor in is when you can make factual statements mm -hmm. that are pretty compelling on both sides of the coin. And I think that's where we are right now. Yeah, so this comes across uh, my email as we're speaking and talking about the lag. You know, this is David Rosenberg, Rosenberg Research. And, uh, you know, he says, how do equities perform after the Fed pauses? He keeps getting that question day in and day out. But in cycles, when the Fed tightens enough to generate an inverted yield curve, we have ended up with a recession and a bear market with a lag 100% of the time in the past. The stock market lows happened two to three years after the Fed moves to the sideline. Think of what happened in 19. 1990, 01, and 08. So, Guy, talk to me a little bit about that because that's something that, you know, you use that expression all the time. I don't want to be dogmatic. And yes, that there have been, you know, kind of um, failures to start with some of these data um, when you go back and you look over the last 50 years or so about recession indicators. But Rosie talks about two periods, or actually three periods, two periods that I was in the markets in 01 and 2008, and they line up fairly similarly. In our Friday pod um, with Danny Moses, we talked a little little bit about some of the similarities that Rosie highlighted last week. But 1990, I mean, you were in the markets then too. And those three periods, I mean, oftentimes investors, you know, they, they know that history does not always repeat, but it certainly rhymes and it appears to be rhyming right now. So it's interesting, the time frame that he puts forth there, you know, I, I'm, listen, he does extraordinary work, so I'm not going to question him at all. What I'll say is the following, you know, I'm surprised we haven't felt it yet, but a couple of things, obviously, the amount of liquidity that was sloshing around the system, clearly I, I didn't fully comprehend or understand or take into consideration. I think that's helped to mitigate some of this and kept us sort of afloat. But I also think things happen faster in today's world than they might have happened you know, 10, 15, 20 or so years ago. So that year or so lag, um, it makes sense. But things are going to start happening, I think, rather abruptly here. So you know, you mentioned the pause. Here we are. I mean, I guess we're, what, 18 months or so out of when they first started, maybe a little less, but when they first started raising rates. So the math is going to line up. Then you have to ask yourself, again, think about how much they raised and the amount of time that they did it. I mean, that's pretty historical. So to think that we're going to sort of, and Elizabeth talks about this all the time, to think we're going to sort of look at the end of the year and say we sort of skated through this thing unscathed, it doesn't really make any sense to me. It's, you know, And I think, quite frankly, given all the things that have been happening, it should actually be worse. But obviously, price suggests otherwise, at least right now. Yeah, well, and, and if you just look at you know the yield curve inversion and thinking about things like rate hikes and the timing and what the effects are of that, it's not, again, and we say this all the time, it's not the inversion that's the problem. It's the re-steepening. Same thing with rate pauses, hikes, and cuts. It's not the pause that's the signal. It's actually the cuts. So, And you don't have to wait until they do cut. It's when they start signaling that they might have to cut. Or maybe the market starts pricing back in a cut because there starts to be evidence that it might be necessary. And I fully understand the, I'll call it hope, that the Fed can at some point just slowly kind of come back down off of this 525 mark and renormalize rates and get to a place where inflation is taken care of. That's obviously the bull case. That's the, the scenario where markets do kind of whistle past the graveyard and we manage to slowly and methodically get back to some sort of neutral period. The difference now, though, is what the heck is neutral? I mean, we, we went through such a long period of zero 
I don't even know that we know what neutral is. And not to mention, are we comfortable with what neutral is, with whatever that new neutral is? Because that's likely to be higher than it was for the last 10 to 15 years. And there's likely to be less liquidity than there was for the last 10 to 15 years. So what does that look like, not only for markets and valuations, but what does that look like for the availability of capital to a number of different sectors and a number of different companies? Yeah. And that liquidity one is something that we've been talking about a lot on the pods over the last few months ago, especially since we had uh, what felt like a bout of added liquidity during the regional banking crisis in March, which actually spurred this breakout, right, that we've seen, if you think about it, and where did a lot of money, at least in the stock market, it went to some of the riskiest stuff, right? If you think about just this kind of AI boom and the biggest stuff. And you know, it's in hindsight, when you think about when we were talking in the throes of that regional banking crisis, when, you know, it looked like we had no idea what the systemic, you know, risks were. And, and, and there's a lot of people talking about that as being a liquidity crunch as, you know, deposit were moving to higher yielding sort of things and the mark to market losses and who know where that was going to go. But the flush into the largest cap tech names was deemed to be defensive um, at the time. And, and this leads me to kind of Mike Wilson, who's doubling down, uh, apparently, I don't mean doubling down, but he's reiterating his kind of bearish thesis and the headline uh, on Bloomberg this morning is Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson says stock risk rarely been higher. The headwinds significantly outweigh the tailwinds. We believe risk for major correction have rarely been higher. Um, and he is talking about liquidity, but he also sticks with his $185 S&P 500 EPS bear case. You know, this is compared to the average estimate on the street of $220. And again, he sees deteriorating pricing and top line disappointment will drive the earnings misses. In addition to profit risk, Wilson also reiterated that headwinds from deteriorating liquidity due to record levels of treasury issuance guy and fading fiscal support. These are things that you've been talking about now um, for the last couple of months. And, you know, the stock market, other than eight stocks or so, hasn't really cared. Yes, there's been talk of broadening out. We've seen that a little bit. But some of the most economically sensitive parts of the stock market, banks and energy, act really badly over the last two months. There's a lot here. So give me a minute. If, if you So you talk about systemic risk um, with the Silicon Valley Bank and some of these other banks. And the irony, of course, is the best thing that happened in the stock market over the last four or five months was probably exactly that series of events. I mean, we can argue it, but it's pretty clear that that, that added liquidity or added um I guess, sort of backstop really gave the market some impetus to move higher. Number one, the systemic risk to me is not necessarily leverage or any of those things. The systemic risk is banks' credit standards are going to be tighter. Regulation is coming. Okay. Whether or not interest rates go up or down at this point almost doesn't matter because it's going to be harder to borrow money. And of course, obviously, credit is the sort of the lifeblood of this economy. And if credit's harder to come by, by definition, the economy should start to slow down. So therein lies the systemic risk, if in fact it is. And we talk about being dogmatic. You know, Mike Wilson is not dogmatic. I mean, nothing has changed in his world. As a matter of fact, I think he's pointing out things have actually gotten worse. The only thing that's improved is obviously the price of stocks over the last few months. But that doesn't change the underlying fundamentals. And it's interesting the people or the mechanisms or the systems or the machines that have been driving the market higher over the last few months and everybody's cheering saying such the fundamentals are in place, those are the same machines, individual systems that could turn on a dime and start driving this thing lower. So, And then everybody will get up in arms, oh my God, you know the market's out of control, the systems are taking over, the machines are taking over. It works both ways. So for those of you that think that zero date to expiry options are the greatest thing that ever happened, and maybe they are on the way up, the same thing can happen on the way down. And of course, the problem is things go down much faster than they go higher. That's right. Well, it, they, they go down faster. I mean, we have some limits in place, but that's how things like flash crashes happen, right? And I don't know that that would happen again, just given the limit down stuff that that is um, there to protect us. But Here's the thing that you made one comment. Some of those fundamentals that people are trading on can turn on a dime. The consumer is what turns on a dime. And I don't know if if people think about it this way, but in order to hit revenue numbers, in order to get that top line growth and maintain that top line growth and to maintain pricing power, you need people who are going to be able to pay those prices and who are willing to pay those prices. You need consumers to keep spending. And granted, they have. And, and I've been surprised, frankly, about how much the consumer has continued to spend even on larger things like travel, right? That has surprised me. However, 
if there comes a time and we are in this period where the labor market absolutely still tight, still strong, but it's starting to show some of those cracks. And, you know, you see the trends upward in initial claims. You see the trends upward in continuing claims. If that's something that starts to really become worrisome for consumers, then they pull back on their spending even more. And as people pull back, those revenue numbers come down. I think Mike's case of $185 uh, earnings this year, it that seems a little low to me, just given some of the expectations that are out there, given the cost cutting that has already occurred. And because the labor market hasn't necessarily cracked yet, but his case makes perfect sense, frankly. And I too am surprised that we haven't seen revenue come down more, but as inflation falls, and now that we are sufficiently restrictive, right, we've got fed Mm -hmm. funds above all the levels as inflation falls, that revenue line will come down probably at a multiple of what inflation is falling, because then you've got pricing power that wanes and you've got competition that comes back in. And if you've got fewer consumer dollars chasing it, companies just are going to have to get creative to maintain even some of the margin that they have. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think the timing of the euphoria about this and and going to Mike's 185, I think his base case has been, you know, $200. And so again, consensus is at 220. But if we had a 10%, like, let's just say the base case, right? Let's just say that that 2023 um, S&P earnings end up being down and they end up being around $200. Well, the S&P at 4350, I mean, you can do the math on that. I was um, looking at facts that every uh, weekend they they put out, and this comes out after John Butter's earnings insight um, blog, you know, the S&P is trading near 19. The, you know, the 10-year average is is closer to 18. You know, so it's not discounting any of that. And, you know, there, there was an article in the journal over the weekend, guys, and, and Liz, I'd, I'd love to get your take on this, is why economies haven't slowed more since central banks um, hit the brakes. And so it was talking about what you just mentioned. Historically, tight labor markets have fueled wage gains and consumer spending. So the question is, when does the consumer spend less? And here was a comment um, or a quote from that article from Tom Barkin, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. There are just a lot of embedded pandemic era forces that are working against this tightening. And then the comment was, it takes time for higher interest rates to ripple through the economy and cool growth as inflation. And Guy, to your point, you know, we started raising or the Fed started raising interest rates for the first time since 2018 in March of 2022, right? And so where was the S&P to start the year? It was at 4,800. It got to 3,600. It's at 4,350. Okay, you can do, you can kind of see where we are. We're still 10%, right, from those highs, but nothing is being discounted here with a VIX that's around 14. So Liz, again, you know, that seems to be the the, the base case scenario for the economy. And I think folks are basically thinking that, you know, we're basically going to have tailwinds as the Fed moves to this pause. And they basically very clearly defined how many more rate hikes we expect to have. Yeah. Well, so theoretically, if you look in a textbook or anything that we've learned, and, and maybe if you average what's happened throughout history, the timing probably should have been sooner where we saw cracks in the, in the pavement and we saw the economy slow down and, and we saw maybe some more validation of what the three of us have been concerned about, right? I think what none of us had a playbook for, and I, this goes for the bulls and the bears, we didn't have a playbook for a pandemic, We've never really experienced this in modern market times. We've certainly never experienced it in modern monetary policy times. And we have absolutely never experienced it in times when we were able to pump so much liquidity into markets. So I think what we underestimated is how long, number one, that liquidity could buoy us. Uh, it was a lot of money, but I think we underestimated how long it could buoy us. And, and perhaps even underestimating how long it's going to take for sucking this liquidity out to actually have an effect. And then, you know, the other part of it is we probably underestimated how pent up people were and how willing they were to spend, even if they didn't have the cash anymore, how excited they were and how much FOMO there probably was after one to two years of being locked in our houses, right? I think there was probably an underestimation of that too and how long that tail would carry on, which is where we are now. And it just, it feels long in the tooth. I keep saying, Just because this part of the cycle is taking a long time does not mean that it ends differently. Are you a fan of uh, Harrison Ford, Dan? Of course I am. In 1978, he was in a movie, Force 10 from Navarone. It was sort of, I don't want to say it was sort of the whatever of guns of Navarone, but in the Force 10 from Navarone, Harrison Ford, I think Robert Shaw was in that movie as well. 
Um, they had to take out a bridge, they being Harrison Ford, David Niven, and these people. Now, they couldn't figure out how to take out the bridge because the bridge was highly guarded. So what they decided to do was blow up a dam that was upstream, thinking that once the dam blew up, the water would come down, take the bridge out by itself. Clever, brilliant. So they put this dam, they put all the... the they put all the the uh, the explosives in the dam. They set it off, and nothing happens. And they're all looking around, like, well, "Why didn't anything happen? Why aren't we seeing the impact of all those explosives?" And the one cat said, "You got to be patient. Let nature run its course. And a, a couple minutes, the thing will start to show its cracks. The dam will break. The bridge will be taken out. And that's exactly what happened." I mention that because I too want that instant gratification of I see everything right in front of me. I want it to happen now, but sometimes you have to let nature take its course, and it's inevitable, and I use this word all the time. The inevitability of this is absolutely right in front of you. The timing is what's so frustrating. Yeah, well, speaking of that frustration, and again, if you're listening to this pod and you're listening to um, Market Call and watch it and listen to you know us over the last few months, and, and I'll just say, you know, I made one crucial mistake as a trader over the last three months. And, and I've said this on many occasions that, um, you know, there's probably one of the worst three month periods um, that I've had from a performance standpoint in a very long time, but not because of a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, not about how I've been trading the indices, not how I've been thinking about energy, not how I've been thinking about small caps. It was like I was a moth to flame to the, the shiniest things, whether it was the Tesla getting back into that short too early or the NVIDIA, that sort of thing. And, and that can be, you know, that can be career limiting uh, more, tra you know, like, you know, I mean, very poor risk management with a couple of stories. But aside from that, I think I've done OK. And that's a really frustrating thing. And to your point, Guy, about, you know, when the levy breaks, what do you got? You, 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 got, you know, I mean, like it was. So sometimes it's really hard um, to kind of get too focused on um, a couple granular things that are kind of at the eye of the storm here. But I like what you did there um, with with uh, Force Ten from Navarone. And think about Harrison Ford, who's got you know this Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's the fourth one. I know you've probably never seen any of them. No, actually, that's not true. Now okay. stop for a second. Go ahead. Those movies I like because there's something there's there's something that's based on fact or something could actually happen now it's a little outlandish some of the yeah. stuff as opposed to star wars with these assholes flying around in basically dinner plates with their lightsabers and shit building mountains out of mud in their dining room All it right. makes wrong no movie, sense long chain but 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 again harrison ford into uh you know blade runner into indiana jones he did a little force 10 i mean he the guy he had probably one of the, the kill, most killer five years of any, you know. Um, yeah, throw a witness in there. I mean, the guy was yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Um, all right. Let, let, let's do this a, a little bit because, the, you know, the geopolitical stuff. And, and here's another thing that we don't have a playbook for. Um, this would be a potential civil war in, in, the, in the largest nuclear power um, on the planet. And, and again, you know, the human toll is obviously something that is first and foremost what's gone on with, you know, how that would affect the situation um, in Ukraine, obviously very important. But if you think back to around the same time that we were talking about when the Fed started raising interest rates in March of 2022, the playbook for major geopolitical sort of unrest is lowering interest rates, right? So they were raising interest rates into that. And, and again, part of it had to do with the fact and, and the inflationary stuff that we saw with natural gas, with crude oil, with further disruptions of supply chains, all that sort of stuff, you know, like the holdover from the pandemic. It is interesting that crude just spiked and then literally it's been upper left, bottom right, Liz. And that's been one of the things that's been very helpful. And a lot of us thought that one of the reasons why the Fed might be lowering interest rates at some point by this time, think about where Fed funds futures were a year ago. They were expecting cuts, right, in the back half of this year. Now they're expecting hikes. But we've seen, you know, crude at the pump come down here. But even with all this uncertainty, and no one knows how this is going to play out. And, and obviously, there's implications for China, right? We've been talking about the analog, well, what might happen if China were to make a move on Taiwan? One, you know, it just seems to be the inflationary forces are, are set to decline. I'm just curious, Liz, how you were thinking about this from a macro sense and how it might affect the Fed and might affect inflation expectations as this was all playing out this summer or this weekend. And again, we have no idea how this kind of unfolds over the next kind of weeks or months. Right. Well, I think that one of the first thoughts I had was uh, 
it's it's almost as if we forgot that there are geopolitical things that can affect oil, right? We've been so concerned with supply and demand, and we're happy that everything's come down and gas prices are lower, and that's helping the consumer, that's helping travel companies, it's, you know, all those things. And we haven't had really a geopolitical shock that sent oil prices in a different direction, completely unrelated to everything that we've been talking about. And I think this weekend was a reminder. And for people out there who are thinking, you know, inflation has come down in a linear fashion, which it has, but that it will continue, this again was a reminder that we have not all the control over whether or not that happens. We could still be doing all the right things. The Fed could still be doing all the right things. And you've got an exogenous shock that occurs and brings it right back up. And I mean, look at what's happening in the UK. They've got a lot of problems over there, right? Inflation back up and not under control uh, into slow growth and, and into an environment where they just can't really absorb it. And that's, I think, the big fear here is that if we don't get control on inflation and if oil is something that drives it completely outside of our borders even, then you've got a real problem to contend with inside our borders, which I hope is not what happens, but it's a real possibility. It's a lot going on. So let's just sort of do one by one here quickly. So the FXI, I think the iShares China large cap ETF, that's what we all look at in terms of China. You know, you're talking about an index, and maybe we could put this in the show notes. It bottomed out in October of 08, around 21 and a half, uh, like most things, and then obviously bounced. Look at where we bottomed out this past October, 2022, 21 and a half. But Think about the bounce. Yes, we got probably back up to about 34 or so in the FXI, but here we are at 27, and the trend has been lower. So Chinese, I mentioned this because obviously the Chinese are doing everything they can to sort of spur their economy, give it a shot in the arm. It's certainly not working in terms of their equity. So keep that in mind because I don't think enough people are paying attention to the FXI. In terms of crude, Dan, you've been spot on with this one. I have not. Um, the underperformance of the underlying commodity is interesting in a word. Uh, Saudi Arabia doing everything they can to keep the prices higher. Obviously, OPEC in the aggregate. Uh, I saw a, a guest this morning on Squawk Box talking about oil demands going to increase by about 25% over the next 15 or so years. That should be supportive of energy prices. Um, it's not manifesting itself in the price at all. I mean, the supply demand fundamentals are out of whack, but the price is stuck here at 70 bucks. I'll still say, and the equities have sort of gone up, gone down. They've been basically slightly lower over the last couple of weeks. I still think in the back half of this year, which is fast approaching, energy stocks are going to be or outperform the broader market. But that's a tough, uh, that's a tough, basically stance to have uh, given the price of the underlying commodity. Yeah, you know, guy, that's a great point in the FXI also. And you know, it's interesting when you go back to 08, it was much more industrial led. When you look at the top holdings right now of the FXI, it's Alibaba, Ten Cent. They make up nearly 20% Metawan, you know, like is you know, those are all internet companies, right? And then you have China Construction Bank, JD, Industrial Commercial Bank. So it used to be lots of banks and industrials, and that was in the 08 period. Now it's it's about you know, it's a lot of consumer led digital sort of things, which I, I think is really interesting. So sometimes it can be a little bit of a, a head fake, but I do think it's interesting, Guy, and we talked about the precedent that was set with Russia and Ukraine. And when you think about the fact that, you know, China's, you know, switch from zero COVID back in January, that was a big shot in the arm, I think, for global investors in equities in general, thinking that this was going to be the engine of growth in 2023. But it really hasn't played out and they keep easing and it's not doing a whole heck of a lot. So that's something I think in the back half of the year, we should definitely um, keep a, a close eye on. All right, last thing before we get out of here, guys. Um, guy, third downgrade by a major investment bank of Tesla. This morning, it's Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is a banker of Tesla. I just think, I, and I know this was a very macro sort of episode. I think that's really interesting. And when I talk about, again, you know, on one of our pods last week, guy, I highlighted the fact that, you know, the second consecutive downgrade last week, you know, Tesla was actually up on it. Today, it's down, you know, opened uh, 2% lower. Now it's only down 1%. It feels like that stuff doesn't really matter, but it's interesting to see how sentiment sort of shifts. And, and I remain bearish of the near-term fundamentals here, but I promise you people, when this thing's back below 200, I'm going to be out of it. And I'm going to be done altogether. But guy, quick thoughts. Three major bank downgrades. It was Barclays. Um, it was 
Goldman Sachs today and one other that I'm forgetting here. Oh, Morgan Stanley also, which Morgan, was also yeah, Adam Jonas. Here. He started it off. You know, it's interesting. The, the naysayer will say that Goldman Sachs has been offside in the stock for quite some time. They downgraded it, but I think they raised their price. It's all kinds of different gyrations, but your point is well taken. I mean, there are more and more analysts downgrading the stock. Now, the run has been extraordinary, as you've pointed out. Um, I will say this as well. As much as people want to say it's not just a car company, which I get, well, they get rewarded for that in terms of the valuation. But at a certain point, there is a car company embedded in this thing, and their margins have been declining. So it, at a certain point, it's going to be a margin story. And in the fall, they told you, they being Tesla, that their margins were going to start to decrease. Where they said they're not going to get down to the historical uh, Ford GM, the sort of the the legacy automakers' margins, which are about 16%, they'd be somewhere in the middle. Well, here we are now probably sub-20, I think headed to 16 with all the price cuts you're seeing. So if the margins is the story and margins are contracting, what is then the right multiple for the stock? And I think that's what both bulls and bears are struggling with right now, Dan. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Liz, before we get out of here, this is the last trading week of this fine quarter that we've been in here. We have an S&P that's up a little more than 13% of the year. We have a NASDAQ that's up nearly 30% of the year. Anything that you're expecting in a quarter end, maybe a, a little more kind of window dressing sort of thing? And 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 might we have a rockier early uh, July, which obviously there's a holiday shortened week with the July 4th holiday. And then we're going to get into bank earnings on Friday, July 14th. So we're going to be in the earnings mix. And, and I suspect with the Fed on pause, um, expectations that they might raise 25 at the July meeting, earnings are really going to take center stage. And that's why we started this episode with Mike Wilson um, and his 185 bear case scenario, base case of $2 in S&P 500 earnings. Because, you know, again, I think part of the story of the markets in the first half of the year that earnings weren't as bad as expected. But now as we settle in with higher for longer here rates, that might be a, a change in the consumer demand picture, which you laid out very uh, appropriately earlier in this pod. Yeah, earnings weren't as bad as expected earlier this year. But remember what happens at the end of the six-month period that we're about to embark on the second half of this year. And when we think about 12-month forward earnings, then we roll 2024 into that conversation. And 2024 earnings are, I think, still expected to be $246 a share, which feels a bit lofty to me. And if that's if that starts to come into the picture and people get worried about it, we could start to hear about downward revisions for 2024 and the market has to digest that. So we'll see what happens with that earnings picture into quarter end. The stuff that I would tell people to watch for is if everybody rode this wave up or the people that did ride this wave up, they're probably going to get rebalanced out of it to some degree at the midpoint of the year. So you could see some pressure that doesn't really have a good news explanation, doesn't have a headline explanation. There's nothing that necessarily happened, but rebalancing could be a force here for the next week or two. All right, Guy Adami, Liz Young, thank you very much on this Monday edition of On the Tape. Liz, we get you back on Thursday on Market Call at 1 p.m. Eastern. Hold on, so before we get out of here, yeah. I mean, I just have to mention, I think the Brewers of Milwaukee are in town for a four-game set against the Mets at Shea. Which one of those, if not all of those, will be attending, Elizabeth? I will be in attendance on Thursday night at this game in Brewers gear. In fact, I'm going to be in studio for Market Call on Thursday. You guys will have me. And I'll probably wear my Brewer shirt. You, as, as you should. I hope okay. you have your Robin Yount vintage throwback jersey. Oh, I don't. But guy, I mean, you got to say. I'll take it, one. My birthday's coming. Somebody want to send me one of July those? <laughs> if you guys see Liz at the Shea Stadium, as Guy likes to call it, which I think has been renamed here, um, you know, buy her a hot dog and a beer. I'm sure she would just kind of love yeah. that as a pre, pre-birthday pre sort of uh, celebration at the park. All right, Liz Young, thanks so much for joining us. Stick around for our conversation. That would be Guy and mine with Bastian Jamat of Linz Capital. Introducing event contracts from CME Group. For individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk. Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. 
Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. SoFi, the all-in-one super app for banking, borrowing, and investing. Earn industry-leading APY, get great loan rates, and trade stocks. SoFi, get your money right. Banking products and loans offered by SoFi Bank NA, NMLS 696891. Brokerage and active investing products offered through SoFi Securities, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Hey, it's Dan here. Are you tired of struggling with your weight? I know I was. That's why I turned to Roe. They've developed a revolutionary medication approved by the FDA specifically for weight loss. It's paired with lifestyle coaching, so the weight comes off and stays off. I started with a free online visit and connected with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional. They prescribed the medication that's helped me drop 30 pounds in the last four months. And now Roe is offering a discount just for our listeners. To get our special offer, go to roeco slash tape. You'll pay just $99 for the first month and $145 per month thereafter. If prescribed, medication cost is separate. That's ro.co slash tape. Today, Dan, we're joined by Bastian John Mott, Managing Director at Lintz Capital. How are you, sir? Doing great, guys. Great to be here with you guys. It's great to have you. So we always, it, there's this fun thing we do from time to time. You know, we'll meet people and we'll ask him or her, you know, where do you go to school? And if you get the answer, I went to school, I did my undergrad in Massachusetts and I got my grad in California. It typically means they went to Harvard undergrad and Stanford MBA, but you are one of those people. I mean, that is no joke. Speak to, you, speak to us about your journey from Stanford to some of the cool things you've done before we get into the nuts and bolts of Lintz Capital. Well, Rewinding back a little bit further, I'm a bit of a uh, a mutt, I guess, because I'm uh, I'm Dutch. My parents are from the Netherlands. I, I'm uh, very patriotically Dutch, by the way, even though I only lived there for a few years. And I was actually born in Japan. So my folks, they moved out to Japan. My dad worked for Procter & Gamble. So it was one of those sort of go around the world jobs selling uh, diapers and shampoo. So um Born in Japan, lived there for seven years, started learning a little bit of Japanese, but then we left just before it, uh, you know, kind of really became solidified in my brain. So lost all the Japanese. We moved to Singapore and that's where I stayed, well, where we stayed until I was 18. So grew up in Singapore and then went to undergrad in the Netherlands. And, um, and then even before Stanford, I, I went to London to work for Goldman. So that was my first job was at Goldman in uh, special sits. Talk to, real quick, talk to me about your experience at Goldman Sachs, because special situations at Goldman Sachs, niche as hell, but I mean, that was a pretty exclusive group of people for a long period of time. Well, I kind of stumbled into it because, how, you know, how old was I? I was 22 years old. I had applied to banking at Goldman and a few other firms didn't get invited for interviews even. And then out of nowhere, I get this cryptic email from a guy at SSG saying, hey, we're a multi-strat investing group within Goldman, picked up your resume, do you wanna come and have a chat? And he signed off with his first initial, not even his name. So I was like, all right, this is all very mysterious, what is this? But went in and met them and, uh, and it became clear that this is not the kind of group that they list on their website, but they do some pretty interesting creative stuff. As you probably know, they started, started with roots in distressed investing, but because it was fully off Goldman's balance sheet, they had a lot of flexibility to evolve their strategy over time. And by the time I joined in 07, it was really a multi-strat group doing public, private, 
uh, equity and credit. And then within the group, there were probably about 30 investors in the London office, which is where I was, probably 30 in Asia and 40 in the US, something like that. And within each team, there were these pods of four, five, six folks with a focus on a particular strategy. And I, as an intern, got staffed on the growth investing efforts with a particular focus on clean tech and renewables. So I don't know, I guess a lot of people's careers start that way, right? It's just whatever you get staffed on as an intern is the thing you end up doing for the rest of your life. Talk to us a little bit about, you said you kind of happened into that situation. You happened into um, an industry focus that is obviously something, you know, 15 years on that, that is really is specifically relevant, you know? Um, and so, you know, Special Sits was this breeding ground for the last couple decades of, of uh, it launched, you know, tons of, of external hedge funds, that sort of thing. Like, how did that bring us up to, to Lynn's Capital? How did, how did you guys, how, how was the firm started and how did that experience at, you know, within Goldman's special situation, you didn't start as a banker, right? And, and so like a, a, oftentimes that is real, it's, it's almost a setback in a way because it's very procedural, right? The way you kind of move through investment banking, how you find yourself in private equity, that sort of thing. But you are now a managing partner um, at a hedge fund doing the thing that you started doing at Goldman as an intern um, some 15 years ago. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think it's kind of funny the, the way SSG even got into doing growth investing in energy tech in London was really through a distressed investment that they made. Uh, this was just, just as I joined the, the team, uh, bought the, the debt in a, a company called Nordex, which was, which is a German wind turbine manufacturer. I think at the time this was around, uh, yeah, oh, oh, oh five, they were probably about the, the sixth largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. But a little bit over their skis operationally, had some had had trouble growing, and uh, Goldman partnered with a uh, an investment firm in in Germany and bought the debt. And it was just I think right place, right time, because wind energy took off in Europe, especially in Germany, Northern Europe, right around '06. And so this distressed debt investment wound up converting into equity and became a runaway success story. Uh, Goldman probably made something like 20, 20 times their money on it, obviously way more than, 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 than how it had been underwritten. And it was really from that moment on, having spent so much time understanding wind and other areas of renewable energy, that this pod was formed within SSG to, to, to keep that focus. I worked there with a gentleman who's now my partner at Lintz Capital, Michael Lintz. So we were both on that pod of five folks. And we both left Goldman around the same time. He went to Kleiner Perkins in 2009, and he co-ran the uh, what was called the Green Growth Fund within KP for about seven years. Uh, I wound up leaving Goldman as well. Uh, that's when I went to California to go to Stanford for two years. And uh, I, I took a little bit of a detour. I had an, an entrepreneurial itch. And so before finishing my MBA, I partnered with three technical co-founders at, uh, at Stanford, and we started a, a software company. Very different from what I had been doing at Goldman. It was called DataFox. And the idea was to use machine learning to create uh, what at, at the time we called Bloomberg, but for private companies. Fact set, but for private companies. The idea was there is so much content online and in government filings and in social media and in news. And if you could use robots to bring structure to all of that, you, know, you might be able to find some interesting revenue estimates and, and uh, headcount estimates and um, lists of competitors that you cannot find on Bloomberg or elsewhere. So we built that and uh, worked on that for about five years. We sold the data set to two types of customers. One was exactly who you would imagine, investment banks, VC firms, growth equity firms, et cetera. And the other segment was the segment I didn't know anything about, but they came to us. That was sales and marketing professionals. There were all these B2B sales reps logging into our tool, using it to find their next 10 prospects. You know, who should I, who should I sell to? Where can I find them? And uh, I guess no surprise on hindsight, that turned out to be an even bigger accelerator for the business. 
And that's also why we wound up getting acquired by Oracle. Oracle has a big CRM product and they saw this as an opportunity to bring more data into the CRM product, make it even easier for their customers to sell. You can't so, do revisionist history and it's an extraordinary story without question, but you sold to Oracle in 2018 with the benefit of hindsight. And, and again, I'm sure you did extraordinarily well, but what do you think, given what everybody talks about now, I mean, we must talk about it 10 times a show, AI and all these different things, and the world is changing. If you had held out, I mean, what type of multiple would we be looking at for Data Fox in today's world? Because I know you think about these things, because I would. Yeah. Well, we sold at about 10 times ARR. And I mean, frankly, you know, my mindset at the time was, okay, we've built an incredible team here. We've got a team of 50 core employees in San Francisco. It was an unbelievable pain to find them all, recruit them, keep them. It's hard to hire and keep a great team in the Silicon Valley because it's so competitive. We had an incredible team, great culture. We had great backers. We were backed by Google Ventures. Goldman had a different team that, that actually invested in our company. We had about 100 employees in the Philippines. Uh, we had about 300 customers. But man, it felt like such a slog because it was such a competitive space. When I, when I explained this concept to you, I see you're nodding your head. You're like, yeah, that's an obvious problem, right? With an obvious solution. Well, therein lies the problem. It was obvious. And so there were anywhere between, you know, 15 and 50 competitors, depending on how you look at it, from relatively big guys like now PitchBook, CBN Sites on the finance side. And then there's a public company called Zoom Info you've probably heard of. We competed with them on the sales and marketing side and there were, you know, 30 others. So it was just, uh, it was a high cost of acquiring the customer. It was hard to keep customers. And so it felt like a linear grower, not an exponential grower. And, and so when Oracle came, came around, it, it felt kind of obvious that this was, this was the right time. You know, it's an, and we'll spend some time um, talking a little bit about your your thought process there because the fact that, you know, there's companies, uh, you know, there's been startups, large platform companies for two decades who've been, you know, deploying machine learning, right, to kind of refine existing processes and, and services that they offer to their customer. And, and I think what Guy's question is kind of getting at is like, why are we having this moment now? We'll, we'll, let, we'll get to that in a little bit as we talk a little bit about Lintz and how you identify, you know, opportunities and disruptive technologies. But I'd love to take um, a step back now and say, okay, so you started in special sits. You went out there to Palo Alto. You got a degree. You started a company that, um, you know, it, 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 you just went through that whole process with Data Fox. You had a great exit. So how do you get to Linz and how does that experience, the combination between starting a, in an investment um, you know, group within an investment bank, which is pretty unique in its own right, right? Then becoming an operator, selling to one of the largest technology companies on the planet. How does that help inform your strategy? And talk to us a little bit about your strategy at Linz. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, upon selling DataFox, it was already pretty clear to me that I think long term, I was more of an investor than a than an entrepreneur. I I loved the, I actually loved the job back at Goldman. It was you know we got to meet interesting companies, and I found the growth stage very exciting because I never thought of myself as a fortune teller. I I can't look at a seed company and really know if that's going to work out or not. But if you bring me a company that has a couple hundred customers and some real revenue, I know how to. I feel like I know how to analyze that business and see if if there's still a long way to grow from there. So, so yeah, I really liked the job at, at Goldman. And, uh, and yet the time at DataFox gave me some empathy for the, the founders that we back, you know, and what are the questions that, 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 I, that, that we really should ask uh, founders when we meet them. I, I laugh thinking back because as an analyst at Goldman, I had the list of diligence questions that some associate had given me, but I, I did not have a feel for which of those questions mattered for a particular business or industry. And now having gone through five years of building my own company, I felt like I had a better sense. And then uh, my former colleague and boss, Michael Lentz, who, as I mentioned, went from Goldman to Kleiner, he had spun out of Kleiner to start this firm, Lentz Capital. Uh, he had started it solo and was 
was looking to grow the firm. And so, and he was actually an angel investor in my company, DataFox. So we had always stayed close. And so he knew I had sold the business and, and that's how we got to talking about working together. And so since late 2019, we've been building this firm together. We're the two p- partners. We've got an investment team of five folks, a, 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 a team of 10 in total. We've raised about $1.1 billion in total, about half of that deal by deal doing SPVs and about half as a fund. And the thesis is it has its roots in what we did at Goldman. So growth stage investing with a slightly broader industry purview, we call it industrial technology. That encompasses themes like climate tech, transportation technology, supply chain and manufacturing, prop tech or technology and buildings. Essentially the built world, the harder industries, the industries that have been a little slower to innovate, the industries where you often need both a hardware and a software solution to really make a dent, really make a difference. And in many ways, we feel like we're in the right place at the right time because the, the low-hanging fruit of, of pure software startups has been picked over. Just like my experience at DataFox, there are 50 competitors in every software category now. And the next couple of decades are going to be a renaissance period for the harder stuff for industrial tech. So that's where we're focused. I want to talk about some current investments in a second and sort of the methodology and how you make decisions. But from 30,000 feet, because regardless of what we do in our, in our sort of finance world, whatever vertical, you have to sort of have a view as to what the hell's going on. And you know, I've said this for a while. I would say since January, I've been extraordinarily confused by the equity markets and some of the things that are happening in the bond markets. I mean, I think I understand it, but, you know, I would submit we haven't seen this confluence of events in in my career. So what are your thoughts sort of at 30,000 feet as to what's happening here in the United States? But we also see, look, I mean, Europe is a mess, but what they've made the decision that inflation is a bigger problem than their growth concerns and they continue to hike rates. We saw it again. You know, what are you looking at? What are you sort of 30,000 foot thoughts on, on the macro environment? Well, at 30,000 feet, I would say there's, there are opposing forces. So on one hand, the amount of incredible innovation going on in these sectors is, is unprecedented. And it, it feels cliche to even start talking about AI, but it's very real. And we can talk about a couple examples in our portfolio companies that are building technology that, that was just unthinkable five, 10 years ago. And now it's real. They have real customers paying for this stuff. It's, it's, and it's, it's moving so quickly. On the other hand, there was just way too much liquidity in all markets, as you know, but very much, very much, that's very much the case in the private markets as well. And it's perhaps most felt at the stage where we play in the growth stage, where there were a bunch of tourist firms that strayed from their bread and butter and put not millions, but hundreds of millions or billions of dollars into, into this strategy and companies raised way too much at valuations that were way too high. And so there's this interesting, um, phase we're in right now in growth equity, where a lot of the best companies, they, they raised at very high valuations in 2020, 2021. And they're now, as everyone likes to say, they're growing into those valuations. And so the bid ask spread is still a little bit wide. When we, when we meet new companies now that are around the series C, series D stage, and we put a frank valuation on that business that we think is totally fair. That's, that's oftentimes, that's most of the time higher than where they last raised capital. So those startups are very uninclined to raise uh, around at this point. And so you're seeing things like convertible notes, ex- insider extensions to the last round and battening down the hatches, cutting cut costs a little bit and just buy yourself more time so you can actually grow into that valuation. So it, it's a little bit of a funny time. Yeah. So explain um, to our listener a little bit. You just said that you don't have a crystal ball. So the idea of like picking stocks um, at or picking companies, excuse me, at seed that's somebody else's game, right? It's to throw a bunch of capital out there, kind of be thematic and, and hopefully 10, 
maybe 15% of them turn into something, right? And then that's how you kind of make your bones in that business. At the growth stage, you're looking series C, series D. So this is late stage um, a little bit. What are some of the things that you are looking for that would say, okay, these th they've made it here. Are, are there certain metrics? Are there certain milestones that you guys are really focused on? And maybe maybe specifically towards the industries that you're focused on also. Yeah. Yeah, at risk of oversimplifying, but this is how we talk about it internally. We're looking for companies that have about $50 million in revenue or more and that are still growing at 50% year over year, preferably closer to 100%. And our proprietary edge has to come from understanding not just that company, but the industry trajectory. The, the companies we get most excited about are the companies where we've spent not a few months but a year or more deeply understanding a shift that's going on in an industry that makes us, I guess, in a non-consensus way, optimistic, extremely optimistic about where that market is going, where at some point it'll hopefully become obvious to everybody. And I'll give you one example. Our first investment as a firm was in ChargePoint. ChargePoint, a lot of people know it now. It's the market leader in electric vehicle charging technology. If you drive an EV, you've heard of ChargePoint. Uh, it, and it went public through a SPAC in, um, in late 2020, early 2021. But we invested in the company in 2015. And at the time, EV penetration was zero point something percent. And the consensus view at the time was it's still way too early. I don't have a single friend or family member who drives an EV, Tesla is probably going to flame out 2015, right? So, you know, this is just not a real thing yet. But we had spent so much time, literally since our time at Goldman, so call it a, almost a decade, we had spent meeting experts, the OEMs, people trying to participate in this, in this trend. And uh, the simple math we did was, Okay, battery costs have co been coming down so quickly. If that trend continues, then at which point will an EV, an electric vehicle, be at cost parity with an internal combustion engine vehicle? At that point, you don't need to be futuristically minded or green to buy an EV. You're going to do it for rational economic reasons. And if you continued that curve, made some basic assumptions around 2020, 2022, somewhere in that zone, EVs would become cost competitive, and that would likely be the trigger for a lot of the large OEMs to also have to roll out EVs. So we said it's inevitable. Okay, how do we play on that trend? It felt way too risky to bet on an OEM. It would have been great if we had invested in Tesla, but you know there were 200 other, I'm not exaggerating, there were 200 other EV OEMs vying to be a Tesla. And by the way, who knows, maybe Volkswagen or BMW were actually going to build a, a formidable vehicle. So Instead, we opted to make the, the picks and shovels bet, which is on the charging technology, not on the charging locations. We didn't want to invest in an asset owner, effectively like a, you know, a, a, a parking company uh, or a utility. We wanted to invest in the company that's developing all the charging technology. And there were about 25 at the time. ChargePoint stood apart from the rest because their chargers were most robust. It was very frustrating to be an EV driver back in 2015 because so many chargers just didn't work. ChargePoint's chargers were known to have much better uptime and, uh, and they, they had a better team. So they seemed like the emerging market leader. So talk to us about that space now because we've had a lot of news in it, right? And so we've seen G GM, Ford, even Rivian just um, you know, adopt that the, the, the Tesla standard charge point was working at a, a different standard. They do have more charging stations, but they're not the superchargers and the reliability, uh, I think, in the Tesla chargers is, um, you know, just clearly uh, far better. Just the full disclosure, I had a, a Ford Mustang Mach-E um, about a year and a half ago. The charging networks away from Tesla were just so bad. I literally turned the keys in after um, a year. And so, you know, I, I mean that sincerely. It's not just range anxiety. It's the the fact that when you get to one of those charging stations, if you can find one, they half the time they didn't work, okay? And you don't hear that criticism about Tesla's charging station. And while I've been very critical of Tesla as a company and largely having to do with valuation, but also 
the um, competition that is here. It's on the doorstep. If they hadn't made this move right now or, you know, taken the, the steps to kind of get access to these credits, opening up their charging network to the competition, I actually think it's not going to be great for Tesla, but I'm, that's not the question here for you. How do you think about a company like ChargePoint now? You were an early investor. The landscape has changed. You know, you are still a holder to some degree, but you distribute those shares to your investors, right, um, in Linz. How do, how do you think about this trade now, I guess? And I, I hate to call it a trade. It's a long-term investment, but it seems that it's shifted. And I'm just curious, as a firm, how do you think about these sorts of things? And are you still looking at the space? Do you see the opportunity to invest in private companies at the growth stage that are still doing interesting things in the charging space? Yeah, I'll say, you know, first of all, the, the single most important thing for, for ChargePoint is continued acceleration in the adoption of EVs. It, it's, it's just not realistic that, uh, that Tesla charging can cover all charging needs of EV drivers as the market grows, especially because Tesla's chargers are largely fast chargers. They're in places along highways. When you're on your way on a, on a long trip, that's when you go and use a Tesla supercharger. The reality of charging though, is that 95% of your charging happens not along the highway, but at two places, your home and your office. And those are not places where uh, Tesla is installing chargers. So, uh, so somebody needs to fill all those parking lots with chargers and it's not gonna be Tesla. On top of that, I think ChargePoint actually just tweeted today that they're, uh, they, they, they shared, they announced that they've been working on uh, an NACS uh, charger uh, compatibility for their chargers since, since last year. I believe they're doing a, a broader presentation sometime next week. So this has been um, you know, expected and planned to, to, support, uh, to support NACS as well. So I think, it's a, I think all, overall, yeah, I'm not sure how it's gonna affect Tesla, but it's great for the industry because it's gonna make drivers like you reconsider driving EVs and that'll ramp adoption. That's gonna be good for everybody. In your world, you could you could look at the way you could do things one of two ways. You can invest a small amount of money in many companies to sort of put a lot of bets out there on a broad swath, or you could put a lot of money in a smaller, more focused uh, group of companies. That's what you choose to do, and I, quite frankly, I think that's probably the smarter way to do it. But it creates a, a number of different dynamics. One of those dynamics, I would think, is you have a vested interest in seeing these companies do well. So there's a partnership. So how do you help your portfolio companies grow? Talk to me about some of the uh, things you do to help those companies. Well, you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head, Guy. We are probably one of the most concentrated growth equity investors out there. And we can do that because we're so specialized. We're not trying to be experts on everything. We only invest in industrial technology. I've been doing it for a while. Um, to give you a sense, we're investing out of a $600 million fund today, and we plan to invest that in just four or five companies. Uh, not all in one go. You know, the first check might be leading a Series D with a 50 to $100 million investment, and then we'll invest more over time. By the way, not just primary, but also secondary. So one of the first things we do after we invest in a company is we start fishing for secondary opportunities, either in cooperation with management management might want to give their tenured employees an opportunity for a little bit of liquidity. So we partner with them on that. They have then a, a known uh, buyer of those shares and not some unknown third party. And the other thing is the early institutions, the VCs that were in the seed and the A, they've been in the company now for five, six, seven years, especially at times like today, they need to start showing some distributions on those funds. And so they're quite inclined to sell 15, 30, 50% of their position to a friendly co-shareholder. And so that's where we come in. And over time, we build, we build those positions. The, the, the way we get the confidence to invest a fund in so few companies is really twofold. One, we're, we're deploying that capital over time as the company becomes more and more de-risked. And number two, you said it, we're extremely involved in the company. We're, uh, we're typically on the board. And um, we're not on many boards. We're on very few because we're so concentrated. So, you know, shame on us if we don't know exactly what's going on in the company. 
and uh, what the opportunities are and also what the challenges are and where, where we need to help them. So, so um, broaden out this, this uh, conversation for our listeners who, let's say, um, you know, are not invested in, in companies like yours and they, they should obviously look at uh, your strategy and, and how you and your partner are deploying um, capital. But for many of our listeners are very focused on the public markets. And I think the thesis that you just laid out is, is like how you're thinking about the, the confluence of software and the advances that are going on in AI and where they meet hard industries, right? Um, so how, how, are there trends, do you think, in the public markets that, that our listeners, our viewers can kind of keep an eye on, right? Because a lot of the excitement so far in 2023 was about large language models and generative AI, right? And the big platform companies who, who stand to benefit, who've been investing billions of dollars um, in these um, you know, technologies for years now. This is not a new thing, right? Just because OpenAI is now minted as a $30 billion, you know, um, startup company, the, the trillion dollar companies that we all know, they've been in this game for a long time. So I'm just curious as you think away from some of those names that we all know about, the Microsoft, the Google, um, Amazon, and, and what's going on there, are there industries that you say, be focused on this because some of the productivity advancements are going to be like they're going to be realizing them for decades to come. And this is probably a really cheap area that you can start thinking about um, how it's going to be affected over, the, let's say, the next couple of years to 10 years. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting uh, one of the most interesting things we'll, we'll, we're going to start seeing in the next few years is the combination of AI and large language models with robotics. And that's going to affect all kinds of very physical industries and many names and companies that are public and that we know very well. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, one of the biggest challenges for any company that operates a real supply chain and has warehouses and stuff moving through those warehouses is labor, right? It's more and more difficult to hire labor for your warehouses, to keep them, to pay them. Uh, some of the most interesting companies that I've met in the last two years are in the warehouse automation space. They've developed robotic systems that are uh, unbelievably accurate now and reliable in um, moving a much higher volume of unfinished or finished products through, through a warehouse. It's a combination of conveyor belts, robotic arms, all leveraging computer vision. So an arm can actually pick an object at the same speed that a human would. And, um, and, and the same goes for manufacturing. Uh, there are a lot of parts of a manufacturing process that now are can can actually realistically be be automated. So, what I would be looking for is what are the companies that have relatively high costs in their supply chain or in manufacturing, where it's now very realistic that in the next three years, not in the next thirty years, but in the next three years, those costs can can come way down, and those companies can start operating way more uh, way more efficiently. Maybe just to give you. One other example, there are a bunch of, uh, bunch of interesting companies now in the, in the touchless retail space. Amazon actually uh, had a couple stores called Amazon Go that also you could walk into and without interacting with the cashier, you just pick up the stuff you want and you walk out. It feels, feels like you're doing something illegal, but you're not. You're, you're going to get the receipt in your, in your email about, about 30 seconds later. Uh, but there are, there's a healthy group, probably somewhere between you know seven and ten companies now that are building the Amazon Go like uh, experience and technology for uh, for third party retailers. So I think that's going to be very interesting as well. It's fascinating. I will tell you, I am not that audience. Just for I, I'm one of these people that like walking into the grocery store and talking to all the different people and having actually a conversation with the person in the checkout. But I am a Frickin' dinosaur, and I get it, and it makes me crazy when I go to my local like shop and stop, and you do the self checkout, and invariably I'll do something wrong, like I'll put my bag down like a second too late, and anyway, and nobody gets. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where, 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 guy, where you will use this first. It, it's going to be a uh, a sports venue, a, a a music venue, or an airport. You're going to be in a rush. There's going to be a huge line at the, at the cashier. And then you're going to glance over and there's going to be this other place where you can just go pick it up and walk back to your seat or, or catch your flight. Now, You'll listen, enjoy it. You're hundred percent. I understand that's where the world is going. I totally get it. But again, I'm one of these people. I don't mind standing online. 
Like, it doesn't bother me. Like, when I go to a Yankee game, I want to yell at the vendor, hey, you know, I'll take a couple hot, but listen, that's a bygone era for dinosaurs like me. Before we get out of here, tell tell the listeners where they can find you if they're, you know, potential investors, uh, people that might be interested in the firm. Obviously, you have a website, but just sort of get a little more granular for us. Yeah, I'd say the the website is a good starting point. So it's linzcapital.com. I can't say we're very active on uh, on social media. Uh, I guess we're, despite being technology investors, we're a little bit old school that way. Uh, and um, and we're based in Puerto Rico. We're headquartered in Puerto Rico with the team spread out across Florida and California. So, uh, uh, you know, I guess it's not the most common travel destination, but if you ever find yourself in Puerto Rico, reach out to us. Well, Bastian, uh, you know, I, I love hearing a, a little bit of, of kind of the conviction that you have at, at, the, at the level in which you invest in private companies and how you kind of track those industries. And we hope you'll come back because, you know, the next time that you, you kind of do something in the logistics space that's kind of leaning on some of the, the stuff that, that is very top of mind right now as it relates to AI, um, we'd love to hear what your thought process is on that investment. So we really enjoyed um, our time with you here today. So, Bastian, thank you so much for joining us as we went off the tape guy on our Monday edition of On the Tape. Love it. You're a gentleman. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. 